was present at Occupy Wall Street on the day that it kicked off, Saturday the 17th of September, which is just three weeks ago uh, from the date that I'm talking to you now. And I've been back there uh, almost every day since then, uh, participating in marches, in general assemblies, um, in drum circles, and trying to remain involved as closely as I can. Um, when I saw that it was being organized uh, here in New Hampshire as well, we have this beautiful long weekend, I hopped in the bus, I came back and tried to make myself available to see if I could lend uh, my perspective to help get this movement started here as well. Although I'm a New Hampshire uh, native, uh, originally from Durham, I'm a student uh, uh, studying politics and journalism at NYU. Today we're sitting here in a park in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, we've been at the General Assembly for the planning of Occupy New Hampshire. Uh, so Occupy New Hampshire is an occupation that will begin on October 15th, which is a Saturday, uh, five days from today. Uh, and the intent of that occupation will be to stand in solidarity with occupations that are taking place in cities all around the country, uh, chiefly Occupy Wall Street. The, the target, which at the, um, the uh, events in New York in particular, is Wall Street, big business, corporations, which is kind of a, a nice faceless um, uh, uh, amorphous enough target that you can essentially, um, anybody who has a particular grievance or concern can blame Wall Street and, and big business for problems. And uh, so it, it, is, it is a nice target to hit at because it is so big. And that would be a reason that you could see a lot of different kind of groups coming out there and expressing their anger because everybody's going to have a beef with Wall Street one time or another. Even if you just lost money in your 401k, you're not real happy with it right now. A lot of people think of Wall Street as bankers in the financial system, and other people think of Wall Street generally as corporations uh, and any kind of non-small business type of corporation. Uh, the, um, the this has been a it's not a target that has um, you know been common, uh, you know, in a sense commonly defined, but rather a target that had taken on many forms depending on who's doing the, the viewing. Um, I, but I think the frustration right now has uh, uh, gotten to the point where everybody is uh, focused in on the idea of uh, it's Wall Street for uh, in its, all its many forms. I think the link between the Occupy Wall Street movement and the environment is part of the whole very pernicious attitude of Wall Street that forces companies to think very short term. As it's been said, Wall Street does not allow you to invest for the long term. They want to maximize profits for this quarter or next quarter so that you hit your earnings per share. The problem is, on a business level, that does not allow you to integrate the triple bottom line and corporate social responsibility very easily into your practices because a lot of things that businesses may want to do, such as you know, integrate alternative energy uh, into their operations, those things typically have a five to seven year payback period and if Wall Street is punishing you for not hitting your earnings per share this quarter, then it becomes very different, difficult for management of those companies to integrate environmental and social concerns into running their business when they might normally want to uh, within a culture that favors long-term thinking over pernicious short-term thinking. I, I, think the, the, I think the corporations in a sense um, or you could say not the corporations per se, you know, the persons we call corporations, uh, but, but the, the, the corporate system uh, has for, again, for, for several decades, this isn't a new thing, uh, has developed this sort of uh, shareholder responsibility mythology that, uh, that corporations have their first and primary responsibility uh, to shareholders and increasing shareholder values. And that's always been a, their defensive posture. When they've come back, whenever somebody brings up an issue that you're, they're, they're, um, uh, they're, they're not doing well in terms of environment or uh, social issues of, of other sorts of dealing with labor and, and the treatment of labor overseas, uh, as well as uh, uh, the breaking of contracts and so on, uh, all of it seems to be uh, defended or has seemed to be defended in the past by saying, well, we're only doing what's good for the corporation. And I think that... Um, that narrative, I don't want to, it's not necessarily mythology, that narrative I think is finally not acceptable to a lot of people. And it seems to be the counter, the anti-narrative, that people don't want to hear that anymore. 
what they want to hear is that uh, shareholders, the shareholder value also comes from uh, making the, the corporation responsible, that making the corporation um, obey the law. Uh, one of the things that people um, don't understand, I mean, the, the law is a tricky thing here. we get posed the question of do consumers respond well to companies that uh, integrate responsibility, you know, environmental responsibility, social responsibility, community responsibility into their products or their operations? Uh, our answer is they absolutely do. Um, people in local communities very much respond when they see that uh, the companies that they're doing business with are putting local people to work, creating local jobs using local renewable resources to, you know, for, their, uh, for their supply chain and for their operations. So once people make that connection that the businesses that they are patronizing are helping to create strong, responsible uh, local, com local communities, they respond very well to that. They tend to be more loyal to those businesses. They might even pay a premium for the products and services being offered, and they tend to be advocates for those businesses in sense of they tell their friends you should do business with this corporation or this business because they are very uh, responsible business people and obviously for businesses it is great to have people out there evangelizing about your product or, or, or service because it lowers your cost of acquisition for that customer. I'm the assistant director with the Green Alliance, a uh, company in downtown Portsmouth which serves eastern New England. We connect conscientious consumers with the business community in an attempt to uh, promote sustainable business practices and grow the local economy while also making buying green very easy and accessible for the citizens of these communities. One of the things that we see studying public opinion is that when the economy is good, you see the second, third tier issues becoming more important. So things like environmental issues or campaign finance issues or gun control issues or abortion issues, then those things bubble up. But when the economy is bad, the economy is the dominant issue for everyone, Republican, Democrat, right, left. And it's various shades of how the economy is important. Um, when, the, when the focus is economic issues, uh, it's gonna be difficult, I think, for environmental groups to make their case that this should be a, a central focus of what these organizations are doing. They may get some lip service and they may get a couple lines thrown in um, to uh, the manifestos that get written, but I don't think it's going to be a central purpose of these organizations to push any sort of environmentally based issues. It's going to be tough to do when the economy, it's when the economy is bad nobody cares about. Nobody, if you don't have a job, you don't care about working in a bad uh, a bad workplace. You, you'd rather work in a bad workplace with bad environmental hazards than not have a job at all. We need to come, out. We need to come rally because we are tired of a decade of war. We're tired of human rights being thrown to the wayside here in the United States so we can give welfare to corporations who trash our environment and trash our nation in order to pad their own pockets. I think that in a sense this is bigger than politics. Both Democrats and Republicans are really presenting us with exactly the same problems. So we're starting to become fed up and realize that it's bigger than just going and punching that ballot between choice A or choice B, when really what difference is there between the two. Uh, so my role here at Occupy New Hampshire and my role talking to, to you today uh, is not as any official leader. It's just someone that's been involved to Occupy Wall Street. I thought I could just come and lend my, uh, my, my experience. Um, having been present at a lot of the planning meetings just like this one before the occupation started in New York City, I can say comfortably that there are as many, if not more, people here in this park in Concord, New Hampshire, than there were in Tompkins Square Park in the middle of Manhattan. The American history is filled with uh, these kinds of emerging movements, and uh, unfortunately we only pay attention to the historical part when we're in the midst of these. We, uh, we forget about the, the long-standing tradition, and people uh, look at these crowds and say, well, that's un-American. Well, in fact, it's probably more American than they may think.
The crowd represented a really, really phenomenal portrait of New Hampshire. We had people that were representing religious communities, um, people from native communities, uh, people from labor, we had students, uh, friends that I recognized from UNH and people that I've had a chance to meet here for the first time today. So we represented uh, you know, all genders, uh, all ages and identities and people from all parts of the state. So it was really, really great to see the level of diversity here. Uh, because you know we can be sure that that's what the occupation will look like as well. It'll be a really diverse body that's going to bring together a lot of different views. The slogan of our movement so far has been we are the 99% uh, referring to the fact that 1% of the country controls 40% of the wealth and owns 88% of the stocks and bonds. So we're that 99% you know workers, students, uh, the middle class uh, and so when you take that big of a chunk of America, you're going to get everyone from black bloc anarchists to tea partiers, you know, people from their first political rally at age 15 to um, having gone through the Vietnam era or even World War II. I think bringing a lot of people together who, uh, a diverse group to use a you know, diversity word, the big D word, bringing together a diverse group of people of different ages from different communities, of different incomes, and having them sort of share a space for a period of time, uh, that's a real education. And I think it's much more of an education than just bringing together people who share a common idea. And in a sense, there's a tipping point, use another popular phrase, there's a tipping point when a movement like this does become so organized that in order to show up at their meeting, you have to believe in their agenda. And I don't think, I think that's what happened with the Tea Party. I don't think that's happened yet with this movement and uh, can't tell whether it really will happen. But right now it's that mixture in the crowd that uh, uh, is, is actually a very positive thing for civic life and civic education. That this body has now formed and through pure horizontal democracy, not representative republicanism, because remember, the person who represents you replaces you. Through two democracy, in the largest city in New Hampshire, and in the capital city in New Hampshire, we have reached a consensus to together, come together, and occupy New Hampshire. This is big, this is awesome, you guys rock. Civic education is a very strange animal in the U.S. We keep on thinking that it's something we t we're supposed to teach to, to junior high and high school students when, in fact, civic education is, is something that, that should go on uh, throughout our lives. And I, I think we've, we've been doing a lousy job in the schools of dealing with civic education, or we view it just as basically telling people, well, this is, there are three branches of government, and, and sort of leave it at that. But I think the, um, the lack of awareness and, uh, is, uh, has a lot to do with the frustration that people have, the lack of awareness about how the system works. And that makes people get involved and, or at least pay attention. When they start paying attention, that's really the start of civic education. As they go down and get involved, there is that uh, interaction with others and exchange of views and uh, they start reading editorial pages a lot more seriously, they do end up getting an education. So in a, in a very real sense, uh, the uh, frustration that started this thing is uh, due to a lack of civic education. At the same time, uh, the demonstrations themselves are really a form of civic education and not just a media event uh, that uh, uh, you know, somebody stages, which is what I think a lot of um, demonstrations have been in the past. This one seems to be much more of uh, the American public or sectors of the American public saying, hold it a second. Uh, again, that was citing a, a movie from the 1970s, Network, uh, where we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. Uh, there is this sense of, um, you know, I don't, I don't know why I'm doing this, I don't know what my cause is, but I just want to vent my frustrations. And that is the first step in the civic education process that I think ultimately will have uh, positive uh, uh, returns, uh, I hope. <music>
Uh, until we hire the you know, leaders in Washington admitting that there are massive, massive problems with the way that our socioeconomic system is structured, with the way that corporations uh, operate within our country, within the way that the political system interacts with those corporations. Until they acknowledge those problems, we're never going to start coming up with solutions. The next step I think we're going to see is, is uh, development of a more structured organization, first within the local movements, and then um, it's, you'll try to see like a national steering committee and coordination, coordinating committee uh, to try to make it into a more national movement. Um, it's, it's somewhat human nature that if you get a, if you get a movement going, you need to organize it, um, and you're going to have people who have been organi organizers before who are able to take advantage of this. But I think the next step after um, the formation of kind of a uh, some sort of national steering or coordinating committee is fallout between different factions within that committee. The key things to watch over the next several weeks are first off the way it gets organized both locally and, and nationally uh, to see how politicians respond to it. There are going to be definite attempts to make this a political issue going forward. New Hampshire is relative to New York and Boston and Chicago and, and Washington. You know, you're talking about relatively uh, small minor things except for the fact that uh, you know, right now we're in the midst of uh, you know, primary season. So I think the New Hampshire one, my expectation is that uh, you will see some uh, you know, extra political activity uh, spilling over from the primary. And there might be a lot more attention to the New Hampshire one. And uh, like I said, it could turn into uh, a focal point for the national media where uh, the presence or absence of, of certain uh, people uh, could make it a story. Otherwise, it might turn out to be just another one of what looks like is going to be dozens uh, of uh, different Occupy slash um, uh, demonstrations. Every single person has a responsibility, if you support this movement, to take it upon yourself to do what you can to further it. And there's a lot of ways to do that even without being physically able to get to a movement. So please, please, please get out there, educate yourself, do what you can, help support this movement. It's taken off, it's growing. We need every single person to help us, uh, and that includes you. So that'll do us for this week on The Green Screen. Join us next week for more solutions. I'm here today because I'm concerned that our, our um, whole world has kind of gotten out of balance. Me personally, I lost my job and uh, I have not been able to find steady work since then. And that was about two years ago. I've worked odd jobs since, on and off. We've, we've worked our whole lives. We've, we've done everything we're supposed to do and we can't survive. I think we are looking for solutions and we are looking to be heard. You can turn on different channels or listen to different radio stations, get very different depictions of what's happening.